Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones you can't solve right now, and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is this strange thing, this strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? The lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with the anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3 a.m.? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or maybe background noise or company. So that's why I make these episodes fairly long so that I'm here for you without the pressure of the end coming. As far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. The primary idea is that it gives you something to focus on, a story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxieties, to help you to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for you. But maybe you need something else, maybe you just need some kind of background. Some people need white noise, or they like the sound of the ocean, or the wind in the trees, or the rain. Or maybe you just need some boring dude droning on in the background. As you're listening though, it's very important that you don't try force to sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story, and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now, obviously, I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but don't feel pressurized. Especially if this is your first night, it actually probably won't work for you. I recommend giving it a solid three nights or so to adjust to the whole idea of it, because it can take some time to listen, get used to listening to my voice, to adjust to my accent to the strangeness of listening to someone talk to you while you're trying to sleep. Or maybe one episode, especially early on, just isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe your problem is waking up in the middle of the night. What I recommend, because it's what works for me, is to let the podcast run all night. Download a whole bunch of episodes, put them in a playlist... And then when you go to bed, start on the latest and let them go. This way, if the stream is still running and you find yourself awake at the middle of the night, you can just pop your earbuds back in and allow yourself to go straight back to sleep. You can even do the same thing if you habitually wake up before your alarm, 60 minutes or even as little as 30 minutes. Carry on listening and go right back to sleep again. And you may wonder what the point is. How useful is it actually just to get an extra 30 minutes of sleep every night? But I can tell you now, I've had people thank me for the suggestion. Because there's something about allowing yourself to go straight back to sleep right before the alarm, that's satisfying on a whole new level. But as you're listening, just relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this may seem strange to you. So give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. 
And of course you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to ask for a few minutes of your time. If you are able to and you would like to support Sleepy Time Tales to help me keep it going out to thousands of insomniacs just like you, please consider supporting the show on Patreon. This is monthly support that not only helps me keep the lights on, but can also get you bonuses based on your contribution level. From as little as $2 a month, you get weekly access to early release on the main episodes, so that you get your fresh sleep aid on a Wednesday instead of a Sunday. And $5 gets you weekly bonus mini-sodes, ad-free edits, story-only edits, and a monthly mega sode which is all this month's releases in one big listen. And the ad-free thing really counts because I actually have a sponsor coming in, hopefully from the next episode, so there really will be advertising in Sleepy Time Tales. And I really am needing the help at the moment, to be honest. Uh, listenership has grown, but support on the Patreon has actually gone down. I'm looking at a few things to help uh, spark it up a little bit. But anything that you can contribute, if you feel the inclination, will be much appreciated. And of course, if monthly support is a little bit too much to ask for, I know times are tough and it is the holiday season, you can make a once-off contributions through the tip jar on the website as well. And another huge way to help the show is simply to spread the word. If you know other people are struggling to sleep and you think I can help, just tell them about the show. And a reminder as well that if you're wanting to start a podcast or have a podcast and want to unload some of the boring, uh, annoying work, I'm also here to help with that. And New Year is a great time to get a podcast launched. So if you're wanting something up and running and ready to go when the New Year kicks in, I am here and ready to help you. Pop me a mail, pop me a line, get a hold of me any of the many ways possible. Links in the show notes as always for my socials and email. And let's get you going and sharing what you're passionate about with the world. And speaking of passions, at the moment you're listening to the new music. Tradition I have is every hundred episodes a new song comes, and this time I decided to do one myself. I don't think it's an amazing piece of music, but I think it's pretty suitable for what we're doing here. And I'm very rusty, so I worked harder on it than I probably should have. But it's going to be a work in progress that's going to slowly change over time as I polish it up and make it as good as I'd like as, in, as well as working on some of my other music and anyway I've gone on a bit long, thank you for the time let's get back to the show and we return this week to a Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens he was not alone but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress in whose eyes there were tears which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said softly, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you, he rejoined. A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much, she answered gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one, until the master passion, Cain, engrosses you, have I not? What then, he retorted. Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed toward you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so. Until, in good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. 
When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words? No. Never. In what then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life. Another hope as its great end. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly, but with steadiness upon him. Tell me, would you seek me out and try win me now? Oh, no. He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition in spite of himself. But, he said with a struggle, you think not? I would gladly think otherwise if I could, she answered. Heaven knows, what I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You who in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain, or choosing her, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guarding principle to do so. Do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you, with a full heart, for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may. The memory of what is past half makes me hope you will have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly, as an unprofitable dream, from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life that you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more, exclaimed the ghost. No more, cried Scrooge, no more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place. A room, not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that last that Scrooge believed it was the same, until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count. And, unlike the celebrated herd in the poem, there were not forty children conducting themselves like one, but every child was conducting itself like forty. The consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and the daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it very much, and the latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What would I not have given to be one of them, though I never could have been so rude? No, no. I wouldn't for the wealth of all the world have crushed that braided hair and torn it down and for the precious little shoe I wouldn't have plucked it off, 
God bless my soul to save my life. As to measuring her waist in sport, as they did, bold young brood, I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown rounded for a punishment and never come straight again. And yet I should have dearly liked, I own, to have touched her lips, to have questioned her that she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair, an inch of which I would be a keepsake beyond price. In short, I should have liked, I do confess, to have had the lightest license of a child, and yet to have been man enough to know its value. But now a knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued that she, with laughing face and plundered dress, was borne towards it, in the centre of a flushed and boisterous group, just in time to greet the father who came home, attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made on the defenceless porter. The scaling him with chairs for ladders to dive into his pockets, to spoil of him of brown paper parcels, hold on tight by his cravat, hug him around the neck, pummel his back and kick his legs in irrepressible affection. the shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received. The terrible announcement that the baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan into his mouth and was more than suspected of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden platter. The immense relief of finding this a false alarm. The joy and gratitude and ecstasy. They are all indescribable alike. It is enough that by degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlour, and, by one stair at a time, up to the top of the house where they went to bed and so subsided. And now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever, when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and as full of promise, might have called him father, and it had been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. Belle, said the husband, turning to his wife with a smile, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? Tut, I don't know, shattered in the same breath, laughing as he laughed, Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, I hear, and there he sat alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice. Remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They are what they are, do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which some strange they were, they were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me, take me back, haunt me no longer. In the struggle, if that can be called a struggle in which the ghost, with no visible resistance on its own part, was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright. And dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap and by sudden action pressed it down upon its head.
the spirit dropped beneath it, so that the extinguisher covered its whole form. But though Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light, which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted, and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and further, of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze, in which his hand relaxed, and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. The Second of the Three Spirits Awakening in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time, for the special purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger, dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new specter would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands, and lying down again established a sharp lookout all around the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance, and did not wish to be taken by surprise and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and being usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects. Without venturing for Scrooge quite as hardly as this, I don't mind calling on you to believe that he was ready for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently when the bell struck one and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time he lay upon his bed, the very core and center of a block of ruddy light, which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts as he was powerless to make out what it meant or would be at, and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be at that very moment an interesting case of spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think, as you or I would have thought at first, for it is always the person not in a predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say, he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing, it seemed to shine. This idea taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe, and ivy reflected back the light, and if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, 
or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping around the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost. Come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas presents, said the spirit. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple deep green robe, or mantle, bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare, as if disdaining to be warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head it wore no covering than a holly wreath, and sat there and here with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cheery voice, its unconstrained demeanour and its joyful air. Girded round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made answer to it. I have never walked forth with the younger members of my family. Meaning, for I am very young. My elder brothers, born in these later years, pursued the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirit? More than eighteen hundred, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn and meat. Pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit and punch. All vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night. And they stood in the city streets on a Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough, but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music, in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings, and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight to the boys to see it come plumping down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough, and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs, and with the dirtier snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been ploughed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons. 
furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times, where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy and the shortest streets were choked up with a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had by one consent caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavoured to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets and now and then exchanging a facetious snowball. Better-natured missile far than many a wordy jest, laughing heartily if it went right, and not less heartily if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half-opened, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great, round, pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts, shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen, lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions, shining in their fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and winking from their shells in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by, and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were bunches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of fulberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk buffins, squab and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons, and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very golden silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant blooded race, appeared to know that there was something going on, and to a fish went gasping round and round the little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down or one, but through these gaps such glimpses. It was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so cakes and spotted with molten sugar, as to make the coldest lookers-on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were also hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter, and came running back to fetch them, and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humour possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own, 
worn outside for general introspection, and for Christmas doors to peck at if they chose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes and with their gayest faces. And at the same time there emerged from scores of by-streets, lanes and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as the bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humour was restored directly. For they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was. God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased and the bakers were shut up. And yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all these dinners, and the progress of their cooking in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if its stones were cooking too. Is there a peculiar flavour in what you sprinkle from your torch? asked Scrooge. There is. My own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? asked Scrooge. To any kindly given, to a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge after a moment's thought. I wonder you, of all the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, You would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day, often the only day on which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge, wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit, you seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill-will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that, and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on, invisible, as they had been before into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that, notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully, and like a supernatural creature as it was possible, he could have done it in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge's clocks. For there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe. And, on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwellings with the sprinklings of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name. And yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then uprose Mrs. Cratchit, 
Pratchett's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks, and now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they had smelt the goose and had known it for their own, and, basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, yet these young Cratchits danced about the table, and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, Blew the fire until the slow potatoes, bubbling up, knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. And I think I'm going to leave it there. We can pick this up again next year, but if you don't want to wait till then, you can, as always, find the original on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. Good night, and sweet dreams.